Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. I'm cheap. I'm an alcoholic. Deeply grateful alcoholic. And I want to thank the committee that brought me out here and asked me to come over here. I'm deeply grateful that anybody asked me any place, any time to go anywhere today. <laughs> and never happened when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I wouldn't expect anybody to be like me. I came from the bottom and I had no place to go but up. So I didn't have too much of a chance of going down. And I'm not going to get into my story too much except for the fact to let you know that I lived on Skid Rose of Detroit, Michigan Avenue for about two and a half years before I met the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And my life had led from a millionaire's country club life to the criminal world, to the sporting world, and then down in Skid Row in Michigan Avenue in Detroit. And when I came here, I didn't think I was going to be alive. I was the youngest kid that walked into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in the Detroit area. And I was scared. You know, I'm not used to being amongst white people. (laughs) I wasn't brought up that way, and my father never allowed you in our home. And I found out the thing that alcohol done for me, it allowed me to tolerate you and mix with you and go to school with you. A lot of things alcohol done for me, I was deeply grateful for. And when you heard those words, cunning, baffling, and powerful, I know what they mean. Because I never dreamed that alcohol was going to take me on the road that it did. Down through two wars and into World War II, that's where I started my drinking. And I'm not going to get in that, and I'm not going to get up to where I ended. I'll tell you what I'd like to get into. Something that every alcoholic sitting in this room can identify with. And that's simply this. Someplace, somewhere, we all took our first drink. And I don't know about you, but I certainly never said to myself, if I go at this stuff hot and heavy for about 15 years, I can join AA. <laughs> Something happened along the line, and I'll tell you this, the minute I tasted alcohol, I loved it. My career started with the 190 proof hospital alcohol that I picked up in, in Guam during World War II. And I loved every bit of it and progressed from there. And I loved everything I drank and everything I tasted about alcohol all of my drinking life, except the few things down I used to drink on Michigan Avenue in Detroit of Skid Row. The one I really couldn't stand was Menden Shaving Lotion. I don't know if you've ever tasted that, but that stuff stays with you for two weeks (laughs) in your food and everything else. But you know, I was a young man when all of this happened. Very ambitious, well-educated. Had that mission of becoming the first American Indian president of the United States. I had a million dollars and lost it. And I sat on Skid Row one time looking up at the sky and I said, God, what has happened? What's happened to me? I'm all alone. And I knew it. You know... I love this program so much, and I love talking about it. But I honestly believe something, you know. When this young man in town hospital got down on his knee and said, God, if there is a God, please help me. That's when your Alcoholics Anonymous program was born. God is the founder of this program, and Bill is the co-founder. Don't let anybody tell you any different.
I get kind of sick and tired of hearing a lot of things that have come into Alcoholics Anonymous today. It's killing a lot of young people. And I still feel that I'm pretty young and I work with young people all of my life since I've been in AA. 90 meetings in 90 days. Hell, I wouldn't have lasted 90, 90 minutes when I came here. But you know, I know God knew what he was doing when he tapped Bill on the shoulder because he knew on October 13, 1958, a very sick little Indian was going to be dying if he didn't do something. And he gave him many opportunities and I never took them. I lost many things. Most of you know I lost a son that have heard me before through alcohol. And if you don't think that puts a lot of self-pity in you, you're crazy. My wife got tired of listening to me talk about that so many times in AA that she says, I'm sick and tired of listening to you talk about losing your son. She says, you lost your son because, because you drank. God gave you the opportunity to have many sons and many children. And thank God he has. Because I've worked with over 3,000 people and only lost about 12 but went back to drinking. We will guarantee you a 90% success rate. I will take anybody in this room and guarantee to be happy in two weeks' time. We have a program now that I've practiced for 36 years. And we have that kind of success rate. Of course, I got a little advantage over you white people. I, I got a heavy Tommy Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't straighten out, you know what happens. <laughs> but you know, the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous came to me one day when I was speaking at a conference in North Dakota. And I was standing before 8,000 people, and I said to myself and to that audience, I love white people. And to me, that's the biggest miracle that AA has ever performed on me. And I still believe it today. And you may not think so when I get done talking. But I truly love every single one of you here tonight. And I'm sure glad you showed up. I'm glad I showed up. But most of all, I'm glad he showed up. And that's what I can believe today. He knew I was coming and he had to form this program. After all, you white people should have formed some program for us Indians. <laughs> got us drunk in the first place. See, you, your weapons didn't beat us. John Carl Barleycorn beat us and you knew it. But thank God Alcoholics Anonymous came along the greatest thing going on the face of the earth, bringing me the one most wonderful way to live in your life. I've been happy and I've been sober since October 13, 1958 when I walked into this program and I still am today. I love every one of you. I want to congratulate you again coming down to Founders Day. I know you're going to have a wonderful weekend to enjoy yourself, to meet and fellowship, because here's where it is. It's here in Akron. You people who have come here have gone the extra mile, which many people don't do, particularly a lot of times the old-timers. I'm not speaking to the young people, I'm speaking to the old-timers now. It's pretty tough in Detroit, we don't have that many old-timers. It seems like the only time we see them is when they got a birthday coming, and we show up at a meeting, everybody says, who the hell is he? <laughs> Did you ever hear in your program down around this way, you know, you get a token, they say, tell us how you done it? I was prepared for him one time in about the 30-some years of sobriety I had. I had a piece of paper in my pocket, and I was going for a job, and I had a resume in there. And he said, how'd you do it? And I pulled this paper out, and I started to read. They've never asked me that question again. <laughs> again, I want to thank you very much for having me here, and I want to thank the committee for the wonderful accommodations. 
And last night I didn't think I would be here because I was so sick that I could not walk. But it seemed like the power of Alcoholics Anonymous and the grace of God has always gotten me anywhere I needed to go in Alcoholics Anonymous. I made that pact with God a long time ago. If you will give me the power and the grace to go anywhere you send me, I will go. I know when I get done speaking, the pain and everything else will probably come back, but that's all right, I'm here. (laughs) And I'm deeply grateful for just one other thing. When you get to be my age and you're still above ground, you better thank God. My greetings, my greetings come from a person called Munster. Now, Munster is a 50-pound Indian cat that lives with me today. He says, tell him to stay sober. I got another friend called Chiefy Bird, and he's a parakeet that's been with me for about six years now. But most of all, it comes from a loving ex-wife of mine, who I talked to today, who's only two years behind me. We're the two youngest kids in Alcoholics Anonymous in Detroit. And due to circumstances, finances, and everything, we've divorced for 10 years now, but we still love each other very much. And I think of her, and every time I go to a conference, I call her up and ask her the one simple question, what do you want me to tell those people? And all she ever says is, tell them to stay sober or else. <laughs> a greeting from northern Michigan. I'm heredity chief of the Ottawa Chippewa Nation in the state of Michigan, belong to the Little Travis Bay Band of Indians. My home is a museum. I'm the great-grandson of Chief Blackburn, one of the last heredity chiefs of the Ottawa Chippewa Nation. And from my world, I want to bring you the greetings and the gratitude that you white people have brought me and the happiness that you've given me every day of my life, regardless of what's happening. And it's sure great to be here today. Thank you very much. your vantage point, but for me sitting here, this man is just glowing. Thank you, Chief. The energy that's not only up on this stage here, but just the energy in in being with these individuals over the last hour or two, is there's more energy in these people than I have seen in myself in the last month, and I think that has something to do with their sobriety and their program. Next, we're going to have Liz from New York with 51 years of sobriety. And this lady is a dynamo as well. What is that? Can you? Oh, Lord, have mercy. I need a stool. (laughs) I'm too short. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you guys know what you're doing to me, but man, it's a mess. It's a mess. I never knew I'd get sober to go through all this. (laughs) I'd like to say good evening to each and every one. My name is Liz. My anonymity shot to hell for a long time. (laughs) And I am convinced that I'm an alcoholic. I'm a very grateful alcoholic. I want to thank this committee that we just had a beautiful dinner together and to hear how hard this committee has been working. I'd love you all to give a round of applause to them. I'm going to start with Calvin, one of my sponsees. He met me at the airport today, and I want to thank you, Calvin. It was good to see you again. 
and that I've lived to see it again. That's a great thing. I want to thank all my Jamaica people, St. Albans. Raise your hands. Come on here. Look at them. Look at them. Isn't that right? And Brooklyn. Where's Brooklyn? Brooklyn is in here too. Queens, Manhattan. There's my Brooklyn. There's there's Brooklyn. I know. Isn't that gorgeous? I don't care where I go, they come to support me all the time. And I can honestly tell you I haven't done this alone. We to do together what I could never do alone. I could never do this by myself. And I want to thank you all for coming. I'm sorry I can't name you name by name. I want to thank all the friends that have heard me speak over the last 18 years out here and all over the place you've heard me. I want to thank Lou for inviting me to Pittsburgh. I had a natural ball up there, Lou. Met nice people and had a good time. I have a good time everywhere, I couldn't tell you the truth. Because I set that up before I leave my house that I'm having a good time. And I do have a good time. So. I want to thank Shirley, both of my Shirley's. I have two Shirley's in the audience. One who stays by me all the time and the other one stays by me. So again, I'm not doing anything alone. I see my other sponsor, Joyce, who I just love to death also. Thank you for supporting me all these years, too. It's, it's just been great. I'm highly emotional today from seeing you and loving you and caring for you just like you care for me. Please expose yourself to this love. Don't stay at home. Go out to that lousy hour meeting to help yourself or somebody else. Believe me, go out to it. You'll be surprised how great it is. I used to go to meetings very, very sick, and my husband would look for me to come back drunk. And I'd come out to the meetings and get all this hugging and kissing. And love. We're the kissingest people in the world, you know that. And, and I'd come back home, well, flipping out. And he'd back up on the wall, because I'm supposed to be drunk. But not with you. I didn't have to drink. I think many of you know I've been through many, many crises and cycles, all kinds of stuff. And this next month, I'll have 51 years. It's awesome. Really awesome. I have no words for it. But I've done it with a daily reprieve and a daily vigilance. Every day my sobriety is my life. And every day I do what I'm taught to do. I live this program, I just don't speak it. And I tell you, you can read that big book all you want because I love it. But if you don't live it, it don't mean a thing. Don't mean a thing. Believe me when I tell you. Believe me. And I was speaking at a meeting last Wednesday. And I mean, I get off, I get on a roll, I'm glad she got a bell. <laughs> because I get on the roll of how good AA has been to me and so many others. And I can't stand to see you play games with this fellowship. It's a life and death matter. A little girl was running up and down in front of me in Valley Stream one night. I said, go sit with your mommy or whomever brought you. I'm not up here socializing. I'm up here with my life, hoping to reach someone else's life always. Bernice, don't let me forget to tell you I love you. Don't let me forget to tell you that. I don't want to get off here without you knowing that. Okay? Very good. And again, you know they reported me to intergroup. I don't know what she thought intergroup was going to do to me. I said she should have went to God or me, either one of the two of us. I had a girl walk up to me one night. I was getting ready to speak in Dix Hills. She says to me, are you sharing? I said, yes. She says, you know, I don't like you. I can't stand you. I said, well, I'll... See two doors over there? I said, you walk out any one of them doors you want. You don't have to stay and hear me. Nobody has to stay and hear me. I said, but I want you to look me in the face 
I love the ground you walk on. And what did she do with that but back up and sit down? First one that had a hand up when I finished. She said, oh, I heard you differently tonight. I said, gee, she must have been drunk the first time. She heard <laughs> he said, nothing no different. I haven't gone out and got anybody a new story at all. I came in here July the 11th, 1952, and I have been here ever since. And I don't plan... Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's small when I say thank you. But you know, I'm not planning to go anywhere. I'm 82, and I'm swinging, baby. And as most of you know, I'm, I've never had a car in my whole sobriety. Never had a car. Don't blame it on that you don't have a car that you can't get sober. See? He had trouble with white people. I have trouble with white people, too, because every night a different white dude picks me up. <laughs> and I upset my neighbors something terrible. <laughs> they say, oh, my God, from a drunk to this, what is she doing now? <laughs> but, you know, thank God I know what I'm putting down today. But I must never know forget the days that I didn't know what I was putting down. I can't forget those days. Waking up in abandoned buildings, basements, places that I didn't know. And I meant good every time I went to take that drink. I'm going to do it different this time. I'm not going to get in as much trouble. And it got worse. It never, never got better. And you know why I stay here too? Because I go to many meetings. And I listen to you guys that go out there and do it and come back in here. Not one of you have told me it's so great out there. Mm -mm. You haven't told me it's great. So I'm not planning to go back out there. I don't care what you lay on me. I'm just coming through a depression. And I want to tell you, that was the hardest depression recently that I've had to grow through, G-R-O-W through. And I went through that depression because life wasn't on my terms. Things wasn't happening the way I thought they should happen. And thank God for the big book on page 449 in the old book and page 416 in the new one. That the word is acceptance. I've got to accept this life, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And nothing has to be on my terms. My will is no good, never was any good, and never will be any good. Because if it was so good, I wouldn't have needed to come to AA. I wouldn't have needed it. And I'm so grateful for that third step, relieve me of bondage of self, that I may do his will. I flew in today. I usually don't speak on the same day that I fly in because I've been up all the night before, practically. And Shirley and I had to leave very early this morning. And you know, the airports are not what they used to be. They work you up behind to get on that plane. <laughs> oh, yeah, they work you. They search you and take your shoes off. You have to get undressed, you, you know. And then by the time I'm hungry, now they don't give you nothing but pretzels. I've been flying for 41 years this year. I have covered every state in this United States but two, Mexico and Alaska. And they're not ready for me. That's the only reason. <laughs> not ready for my help. But I was trained in here very well never to say no to anyone or any place that I'm asked to go. And I've been very successful in doing that these 41 years. I say 41 years because when I got to 10 years of sobriety, I had the honor and privilege of speaking for our late co-founder, Bill Wilson. And Bill presented me with my first big book, 
And in it he wrote, Dearest Liz, you are a magnificent demonstration of all that is AA. Now, if Bill loved me like that, am I going to worry about you? No. <laughs> no, Bill really loved me. He was good. He was a beautiful person, too. And so I keep coming. I keep giving. And I'm going to say a couple of things. How much I can? Oh, okay. I go to a group in the city, and they sit somebody down in the front with a card. And the card will tell you, you got 10 minutes. Then it'll come up, you got five minutes. And then it'll come up, good night. <laughs> so that's enough to shut you up. Right there. See? But see, sometime I get up here, and most of you know I get on a roll. Whoo, Lord, that mercy. I used to dance all over the stage. Yeah, I used to show you what I was at 17. I'm still showing you that at 82. Come on now. Yeah, yeah. Come on now. I was talking in Brooklyn one night, and I was standing up here saying, if you see what I got and you want what I got, and I was just shaking, and the guy winked at me. I said, man, I ain't talking about that stuff. Let me rephrase this thing. <laughs> rephrase it. I'm getting ready to get myself in trouble. I've been out of trouble a long time, thank God. Thank God. I do thank you. I want to thank you for your love. I really do. I don't know where I'd be today if it wasn't for you. Give somebody some love. Speak nice to somebody when you leave this place. Hug somebody. But most of all, give of yourself somebody, someplace, somewhere. And you'll see the benefits that will come back to you. I've had nine operations in 41 years. I've been to death's door nine times. God keeps bringing me back. He keeps bringing me back. I went up and had three operations in six weeks. The doctor says to me, you've got cancer. I'm giving you six months to live. I said, you don't talk to me like that. <laughs> I'm in a fellowship that teaches me I live one day at a time. I'm now 36 years. The doctor's dead, I'm not. <laughs> he he been gone, and I'm still hopping these cabs and buses and subways and trains and planes. Come on, what you gonna do with your life? What are you gonna do with your life? Come in here and live happy, joyous, and free. That's what the name of the game is. And don't ask me if I have a boyfriend, because I'll tell you I'm happy, I'm joyous, <laughs> and I'm free. Totally free. Yeah, you're right. That's right. And I'll beg you, watch your relationships in AA. That 13th step is a cuckoo loo loo boo boo. Gotta have love and respect for each other and grow together, stay together. There's been a lot of happy marriages in AA. There's a lot of unhappiness too. Let God give you somebody. Because learn that what you pick ain't from nothing. <laughs> nothing. Mm -mm. You look, what you, look at your past. Look at your past. Let your past tell you something. Let your past tell you something, because it will tell you something. Please get sober for yourself. If I had to stay sober for my mother, I'd have been drunk, drunk, drunk. For Mr. Bailey, I'd have been drunk, drunk, drunk. Mr. Bailey couldn't stand me in AA. 
After I spoke for Bill, he asked me to please leave, and I did leave. My oldest son is 63 now. He was 12 when I came in. He still hates my living guts, but that's all right. I found a God who has forgiven me 70 times 7. Woo! I'm telling you, any man, woman, or child want to hold my pants over my head has to be their problem. That is not my problem. I love him. He's going to be like the prodigal son. One day God will have him ring my doorbell. Yes, he will. I just have to wait patiently That's all. and keep love in my heart for him. My second son was shot and killed at the age of 28. And I don't cry for my son because I would disturb his beautiful spirit. My sister went in right after he was killed, and she jumped 30 floors. I just lost a daughter recently, Lou Garrick, to see a beautiful girl go down to a skeleton. Almost killed me. I walked the streets of Jamaica for many days, coming from that hospital, crying. But the AA members were with me. And God sent me an angel to be with my daughter at the end of her life. I went to 12-step, this young man, take him to a meeting, and bringing me back from the meeting, I said, don't take me home, take me to the nursing home to see my daughter. And he took me to see Judy, and he fell in love with my Judy, and he started going every day to take care of her, and he gave her a good Christmas, he'd take her to dinners and beauty parlors, and he made the last of her life a very happy life. And he got sober. He got sober. And you girls and boys don't know, he took the weight off me, too. He took a lot of weight off me to let me come back to myself. So we love each other and we care for each other. I have a beautiful AA baby. She just made 46. And she's gorgeous. I have 12 grandchildren that I see by appointment only. <laughs> I do not babysit. No. No babysitting. And I have five great grands. God has been good. And he's good all the time. If you let him, you've got to let him. You've got to let him. Get yourself out of your own way, please so that you can have this beautiful life that we can do together, but I can't do alone. I love you guys. I love seeing my girl here too. She had a, I don't know if my girl is from the table tonight. I'd like you to meet this young lady who had a motorcycle accident. And when I saw her walking up there in my face tonight, I almost went to the floor because she says she's following my footsteps. So, honey, you headed for something. You headed for something, I'm telling you. But I love you so much. Her name is Peggy, too. And I'm not shooting her anonymity because I didn't mention her last name. See, but that's Peggy. And I'm so grateful for God and you, Peggy. Many of you, many of you. I could stand up here all night and mention you. And you know who you are, though, in my life. Yes, you do. I had two young dudes. You know, I, my doctor asked me, do I go to senior citizen? I said, oh, no, no, no. She said, why, Miss Bailey? I said, because I can't stand the moaning and the groaning. <laughs> no, I really can't. I hang out with these young dudes in AA. Fine young dudes. Who's going and giving and doing. And you see what they do to me? They charge me up. Charge me right up. Get a hold of one of them, because they're the next legacy, really. They're our next legacy. And we need to keep them here. And don't put them down for no God-given reason. Hear who they are. I love you. Oh, yes, I do. I love you. And I got to watch myself, because I could break down up here so bad. But I'm trying to keep myself up, because I'm not allowed with stress. And I try to stay away from stress. Oh, the bell is ringing, honey. Thank you all.
think that that's hard trying to ring that bell. It, it truly is. We are a diverse group that normally would not mix. Steve, how does it feel to be in the white minority up here? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Steve P. from Menor, Ohio, with 56 years to bright. My name is Steve, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, boy, that's a couple of tough acts to follow. Uh, you know, I have a uh, <clears throat> thank God for AA because I didn't have to go through a lot of, I didn't lose a lot of things like other people did in the, in the program. Uh, I had a brother that was, uh, became an alcoholic in front of my eyes when I was a little kid. He happened to be driving a uh, car that killed my dad when I was four years old, and I watched this man become an alcoholic, and I decided that I would never take a drink, and maybe I, <clears throat> I never wanted to be like that person. But somewhere down the road, when I was about 16 or 17, I took that drink, and it was like pouring gasoline on a fire. I started drinking every day, right, almost right off the bat. And by the time I was 22 years old, I was a worse drunk than my brother. The guy I used to go after at the bars, he was coming after me. In November of 1944 was my first entrance into AA. I was 23 years old. And there was a guy that, when I was going up to the steps to the Doan Men's Group, they met on a Sunday afternoon, they used to call them training meetings, and I went up there at 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon, and some guy met me at the door, and he says, hey, kid, you in the right place? And I says, yeah, I want to quit drinking. He says, go inside, keep your mouth shut and your ears open, and that happened to be Harry Ryan, one of the old timers. And I'm grateful to every person that was here long before I was because they're the one that kept me so. I didn't stay in the program very long. I, I, <clears throat> that was in October in 44, and New Year's Eve, 1945-46, uh, I took my, <clears throat> my mother handed me my first drink. And I knew right away, as soon as that drink went down my gut, that I knew where I was gonna go. I went back to Shakey's Bar where I used to drink, start drinking the same way I drank before. I made a fool out of myself for nine more months. Labor Day, 1946, is my anniversary date. I was 26 years old this time. I made up my mind I was going to do something about it, and I started hanging around with the right people, the right places. They took me to the jailhouses, the courthouses. <clears throat> Salvation Army, wherever there was a person that we could work with. Twelve-step work back then was a priority. They, nobody admitted they were an alcoholic back in them days. They, you had to go fish them out. You'd go into the flop houses and everywhere went to, to look for these people. And I worked with them. I helped sponsor a few people. I learned how to live this program. I learned how to love this program. Because without this program, I wouldn't have anything I have today. Next month, I'm going to be 81. I'm going to be 82 years old. And, uh, I have a wife that's going to be 60 years that we've been married, and she's sitting right over there. Thank God for AA. I had four children by her. One of them was killed in an automobile accident. She wasn't driving and she was walking and some drunk hit her. He was 60 years old, had three DUIs, and uh, he never knew he hit her. And the judge asked uh, us to... He sent us a letter because this happened in Florida and he sent us a letter out here to Mentor asking us what would the punishment 
a good punishment be for this gentleman? And of course, my daughters wrote, kill him, shoot him, hang him, throw the key away. And my wife wrote the same, something similar to that. But I didn't write that letter right away because I was going to meetings and I had people hanging around with me in AA and I made sure I went to a lot of meetings right after that because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether I'd kill this man I would try to help. And you people had taught me in these rooms that I should learn how to love. And that's what I did. I wrote the judge back. I said, this man needs a lot of help. She did it against me. The man died a few years later of cancer. <clears throat> he never served his ter term. He only served about five months. I never know, <clears throat> never know that I could do that. But you people in these rooms taught me how to love. Taught me how to love and how to live and how to be a decent person. Thank God for the AA. My brother that was an alcoholic, I was sober about five years. And he called me up and he says to me, Steve, I want to join your club. And I said, Gus, I said, there's no club, but there's a lot of people there that know you and they're waiting for you. They knew you were going to come. Well, anyway, this, this person that I didn't want to be like died when he was 87 years old at 40 years of sobriety. Thank God for AA. How I stay sober today, I do the same thing I did when I came in. I go to meetings. I go to three, four meetings a week. Uh, I try to help another drunk. I got a home group. I'm still making coffee there for the last 30 years. And you know what, how I got that job, until one day I complained about the coffee, and, <laughs> and the guy said, you make it tomorrow. <laughs> That's what I did, and I've been there ever since. We meet every Tuesday, we have a beginner's group, and I'm so anxious to get there to, to start setting up the meeting. I still set it up, I go there at noon, and I set the meeting up, and then I go back at 6 o'clock and I set, make the coffee for the beginner's meeting at 7 o'clock. And then our regular meeting starts at 8. But I'm so anxious to see these people coming through them doors and shake their hand. And if somebody's missing, I always ask, where's this guy? I haven't seen him for, I haven't seen him for a couple of meetings. I'm always looking for somebody to talk to. A young fella come up to me, you know, I thought I was young when I came into the program. He come running up to me when I was making the coffee, and he says to me, he says, Steve, he says, I just joined your home group. I want you to give me something to do. And I said, how old are you? He says, 14. 14 years old. And I thought I was young. And he's telling me, and I talk to these young people as they come through the door, and they tell me it's no different out there than when I was out there 56 years ago. The same torture and, and <clears throat> the headaches and the jails and everything's all waiting for me out there if I ever take that first drink. It's still there. I don't have to. Thank God for AA. I don't have to live that life I had before. Worrying about whether the jail was going to, uh, somebody going to throw me in jail the next day. Because I, when I was drinking, I was in every racket that you could think of. And I never ended up in jail. My boss wouldn't press charges against me. He could have sent me to the federal penitentiary. He never did. Thank God for AA. Because I would have been in a penitentiary sure as heck. Or dead. I had a lot of people after me. I was a mean, selfish person. And you people taught me how to be a different person, how to love and understand. Share this love with my fellow man. Thank God for AA. I have a lot of good friends in me. If you, if you judge a guy's wealth by his friends, I'm more than a billionaire. 
because I have a lot of good friends in AA. Right there, they're sitting there from Menor, Ohio. They come up, give me support. Oh boy, I, I need it. <laughs> I want to thank everybody here that came here, and, and, and I wish you uh, uh, the next three days have a good time and enjoy it. I, uh, I want to thank uh, Dana for asking me and the committee for putting such a wonderful thing together every year. And I hope I could come back some years later and I'll still be sober. Thank God for AA and I love you all. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.